Continuing with the detailed checks that IDEA provides, we'll see what happens when we have anchor connections, whether they be base plate connections or any type of anchor to concrete elements. In these cases, IDEA provides additional, detailed results, in addition to those that we've seen previously. Before showing you the results, I'll recap a couple of important points. Whenever we're talking about this type of detailed result, I'll refer to two things. First, how the shear force is transferred, which we can specify in the anchor plate operation, and which can be of three types, via anchors, by friction, or by shear lug. In a moment, we'll see when to use each of these options. Then, second, a particularly important point, if we want to specify a standoff or not. What does this mean? This standoff is the element that we'll have between the base plate and the concrete block. It can be of the direct type, where the base plate rests directly on the concrete element. It can be via a mortar joint, which tends to be most common, this compressed grout, which is used in these cases. Or it can be with a gap. For the moment, we'll use this direct system and then we'll change it and see what differences there are between it and other systems. Instead of calculating the connection, I'll use one that I have already calculated and saved. It's exactly the same connection. I go to the check section and we see that in this detailed results section, some new tabs appear. We have anchors, which in this case have replaced bolts because the connection doesn't have bolts. But if we had a bracing element, for example, with some bolts, both fields would appear, both bolts and anchors. Then we have concrete block. If we go to the anchors tab, we get a table, the usual table that we're accustomed to seeing, very similar to that of the bolts. And then also this diagram below, which is exactly the same. It shows us the various elements, the various anchors, how they are positioned, and which one we have selected in the table. We can also see the direction of the shear force, and so on. If we look at the values that we have in this anchors table, we see that we have a very similar format. First, the status where we see if a particular anchor satisfies the various checks or not. Then a name for each anchor, useful from the point of view of being able to relate them to this graphic that we have in the bottom section. Next, the metric and grade of the anchors. Loads. As we've seen, in the event of having different combinations, the program will show us which one is the extreme combination for this particular anchor. Then we have the values that we'll use for the check. On the one hand, the tension force that appears for each anchor. Obviously, there will be anchors that are working in compression, so they won't have tension force. In this case, we see that if we insert a separation between the anchor plate and the block, the concrete block, then a compression force does appear, and this will be relevant for the check of this anchor. Then we have the resultant vector of these shear components, and then we have the resistance values for the anchor. In addition to the resistances of the anchors themselves, which are the same for each of them according to their grade and metric, we have some additional resistances, or rather, a variation of these base resistances. What does this mean? As you know, in this type of connection, when I have anchors working in tension, two things can happen. Either the anchor itself fails, it breaks. It is also possible for the plate to fail, but from the point of view of the anchors, only two things can fail. This anchor, or it's possible that, Although these anchors are perfect, when they start to pull on this connection, here in the concrete, cracks are produced. This is known as concrete cone breakout, i.e. if I pull hard on this column, it's possible that the anchors function perfectly, but that they end up pulling out all this section of the concrete. This particular check, this evaluation of the concrete cone, can be taken into consideration, or not, by activating this option in the code setup as I've mentioned before, this concrete breakout resistance box. When should this check be used, and when shouldn't it be?
we'll consider it from the point of view of whether we have unreinforced concrete foundations or foundations with a reinforcement only in the bottom part, i.e. rigid footings. If we had a foundation, or this was a pilaster, or a, sim a similar element, that was strongly reinforced, it's clear that the reinforcement that we had in the fitting would prevent the crack from opening. It would prevent this concrete cone from separating. So, if we have a strongly reinforced foundation, it doesn't make sense for us to do this check. If this isn't the case, and we do actually need to carry out the check, the means of considering this breakout, used in IDEA and provided in the code, is by reducing the tensile resistance of the anchor. Note that the base tension resistance is 76.9, but, depending on the length of the anchors and the dimensions of the concrete element, we see that the tension resistance that appears now is considerably smaller. Note that this behavior is extremely important. This, as I said, depends on the dimensions of the concrete element, i.e. if my concrete element is smaller, if the edge of the footing is here, then with just a small crack opening with less force, a crack will open and the whole concrete block will move. If I have a footing or a foundation element that is sufficiently large, what happens is that this crack to obtain the same concrete cone breakout will have to be much bigger. Therefore, I'll need much more load, and this means that the concrete breakout resistance will be much greater. So, as I've mentioned before, and I'll insist on now, the concrete elements, these foundation elements, should always be designed with the most realistic possible dimensions. What does this mean? In general, we won't always have the dimensions of the footing, but, more or less, we have a ballpark estimate of its size. So, if we know that the footing is going to measure more or less 2 by 2 meters, we'll have to design the footing in accordance with these dimensions, from the point of view of doing this concrete cone breakout check. Then, the next field that we have is the shear resistance of the anchors. Note that, now, all the anchors have the same resistance, which in reality is determined by the geometry of the anchor, i.e. by the individual stress limit of each and by its area. Nonetheless, these values are shown for each anchor individually because they could vary when we introduce a mortar joint or a gap between the base plate and the concrete block. Why? Because when we introduce this type of separation, it generates a bending in this free section of the anchor. Even with the mortar joint itself, although we have a good enough mortar joint, IDEA, staying on the safe side, considers that this mortar barely restricts the bending of this anchor. Consequently, it would be fairly detrimental. And so I advise that this type of mortar joint is only used in those cases where it's done with a poor mortar, a mortar which barely provides any resistance. If the mortar, in the end, is of the same or a very similar value to the concrete element, of course it is also going to restrict this movement of the anchor. And it's not necessary to take it into account. So it's preferable to make a direct transition. Now, I'll show you an example in which I introduce a separation, a mortar joint, and you're going to see that a value like 50.2 actually ends up being fairly inaccurate. Once I have the loads, I have the resistances, the program then gives me the various utilization percentages. In this case, it compares the tension force with the resistance to tension, and I get the percentage of utilization in tension. In exactly the same way, I get the percentage of utilization in shear, and also the interaction of tension and shear. In addition, you see that here appear two other columns for special checks of shear, also related to concrete cone breakout. The first of them is called concrete pryout failure resistance, and here in this next image that I'm showing you, we'll see this behavior. Let's imagine that in this image at the top, I have a shear force from left to right, with this direction, and in addition, my anchors have a certain tensile force. So what could happen in these cases if, I emphasize, I don't have elements that are sufficiently reinforced? In this area here, the fiber starts to be compressed, 
and it becomes a hinge, a point of rotation. This area behind will have to lift up, i.e. it will generate this crack, and this part here will be able to rise. Then, the other field that I have, the column to the right, is related to this displacement in block, or this concrete edge failure, in the event that we have anchors very close to the concrete edge. In this case, I have shear, acting from right to left, downwards, and that pushes this anchor. It may be the case that this distance isn't sufficient to absorb this shear, and it would generate these cracks, leading to this pullout of the whole block. This, as you can see in these images, is, of course, much more damaging, and it's a real, very important behaviour in those cases in which we have fasteners or anchors that are very short. If the anchors were deep enough, it would be very unlikely that this effect would be produced. So, from the point of view of idea, returning to the check, what it's providing in these columns is the shear resistance for these effects. That is, this pry-out effect would be produced by a shear of 28.6 or more, whilst this effect of concrete edge failure, due to the separation of the anchors from the edge of the element, is produced by a shear of 29.8. And finally, the other parameter that will be calculated is the detailing. It works as we saw with the bolts. If I activate in the code setup this detailing check, then the program will check these minimum geometrical distances, this distance between anchors and the distance from anchor to the edge of the plate. As with the welds and the bolts, I have the option of viewing this calculation or this check in a detailed numerical format i.e. I can see it here, or I can make it much bigger, to see, one by one, how the program has analysed the various parameters and how it's obtained the various check percentages, with some notes and references to the code in which these parameters are defined. So, this is the anchors section. Now, we see that we have another tab, named Concrete Block. In this case, in addition to the detailed results, we also have some visual results. Here, there appears a series of options. With this button, I can see the distribution of stresses that are produced in the concrete element. Here, I can see them on the 3D connection, or I can see them when I activate the concrete block in this detailed graphic results window. Here, we have this distribution of stresses that is produced by the contact in the concrete. Once again, obviously, if I've introduced a separation between the base plate and the concrete element, this check wouldn't make any sense. It would be satisfactory in every way. I can see this distribution of stresses, or I can see, as with the strain check and the general check, a traffic light type schematic with which the program shows me for each of the regions, in the event that I had various regions working in compression, from the point of view of the concrete, the state that they are in. They'll be in grey if working below 60%, in green if between 60% and 95%, in orange if between 95% and 100%, and in red are those zones that do not satisfy the check. How is the concrete block checked? What is IDEA doing internally to check this concrete block? What the code provides, since we haven't modelled the concrete block with 3D elements, is the following. First, we generate an initial contour, this contour with dashes that you see here, which will be something like the transmission zone, transmission of compression from the metallic element to the foundation. Of course, this zone is going to vary according to the thickness of the plate, according to its stress limit i.e. if I have a very slim plate, it's to be expected that when I push down, when I apply an axial compression, the zone of transmission to the foundation will be very concentrated around these stiffening elements and in this section of the main element. However, when I have a very thick plate, a very stiff plate, this transmission is more uniform, it's smoother, and so the transmission zone is rather bigger. I would have a much bigger area of transmission. So this value, this consideration, is defined via this parameter labelled C, the bearing width. 
which basically is an offset in relation to this line, this edge of the various elements that would transmit an axial of pure compression. So, as you see, it's uniform. It's distributing this axial all through the element. What happens when, in my connection, I don't have pure axial? I don't only have compressive axial, when I also have bending moments applied. Then there would be zones working in compression and zones working in tension. I can see this via this stress schematic that's showing me these stresses in the concrete. What I'm seeing is a distribution of stresses and then an area in which I have no stresses. This top area, which is working in tension. The plate separates from the concrete block. However, to be on the safe side, in the zone of compression, IDEA won't consider the whole area obtained. Why? Because it's a finite element program. Therefore, this distribution of stresses may not be very precise. So it's advisable, in these cases, to maintain a small safety margin. How is the safety margin defined? In the code setup, I mentioned before that we'd be seeing this, we have a field named Effective Area, Influence of Mesh Size. By default, this setting comes configured as 0.1, although for now I've put it at 0.3 so that the effect can be observed better. What does it mean? This effective area is that surface over which this compressive equivalent stress is going to be spread. So when I enter 0.3, the program calculates the maximum stress that it's going to produce. It applies 30% and from these stress isolines, it generates for me the cut, the intersection of the surface. And therefore, the effective area to be used to do this check is the superposition between this new area that I've generated and the area obtained by the axial of simple compression. So, the effective area is delimited here by this dark outline, which itself is delimited by those stresses that we've discussed. And in this area here, it's delimited by this distribution of pure compression. If you look here, this area isn't taken into account because the stresses usually tend to be concentrated in this middle part. Therefore, with these lines of shading, the schematic is showing in this bottom part the effective area that's going to be used in this field here. So, to do this check, the program obtains average equivalent stress, i.e. with the equivalent axial for compression and bending moment, it divides it by this effective area, and it generates the stress that's going to apply on the concrete block. Then it applies another stress coefficient, and lastly it obtains the bearing resistance of this concrete block. Comparing this average stress with this resistance is how the concrete block resistance check is obtained, as a relationship, a percentage, between this load value and this resistance value. Of course, as always, I can see this calculation here, in this drop-down window, with the various parameters that the program uses. Lastly, in relation to these anchor plates, in some cases, an additional tab appears for the shear check. This tab appears when we have specified for the shear transfer, friction or shear lug. Here I have some prepared connections where I've used different hypotheses. In this first connection, I've designed a shear lug which basically is an element that is embedded in the concrete. And therefore the transmission of this horizontal force will be via this shear lug into the concrete. When I go to the check, I see the following. In the anchors section, the shear resistance check doesn't make sense. No values appear. The program hasn't done any check. And note too that the shear force, as expected, is practically insignificant, given that the shear is transferred through the lug. Now I have an additional tab, the shear tab, on which I see this evaluation. I see the check that it does. What does the program do? In the local axes of the shear lug, it obtains the various loads of forces, for shear in Y and shear in Z. In addition, it obtains the shear resistance in Y and in Z, and it also does the check for the bearing that's produced in the concrete, which is this resistance value shown here. 
So, comparing these three values, it takes the maximum, and that's what defines the utilization percentage. So, the utilization percentage will be the maximum relation, the most unfavorable relation between the shear in Y and the shear resistance in Y, the shear in Z and the shear resistance in Z, or the resultant shear, this vectoral combination, and the bearing resistance of the concrete. Here, again, I have this more detailed check with these more detailed calculations. Also, when I'm viewing the equivalent stresses throughout the connection, I can see that state of equivalent stresses of this shear lug that I'm using. It's a similar story when I have shear transfer by friction. In this case, the evaluation of the shear is done independently of the anchors with this window, and it has something very similar. It has the loads in each of the axes and resistances in each of the axes eventually obtaining an, a utilization percentage, which in the end is a ratio. Note that the program considers this friction to have a value of 0.25. And, of course, this value can be modified in the code setup, specifically here in the concrete block section, in the field friction coefficient. Lastly, we'll see what happens when we define a small separation between the base plate and the concrete element. As I mentioned, it's fairly unfavorable from the point of view of the anchor check, given that it reduces considerably their shear resistance. So, in this case, we're going to assume that the shear transfer is by the anchors, and I'm going to insert a separation, a gap of 30 millimeters. We'll put it into a front view to be able to see what's happening. This part with the anchors, which is free, will have a certain bending, and this indirectly will affect the shear resistance. As you can see, although it has the same forces as it had previously, in this case, the check has been considerably less satisfactory, i.e. with very little load, the connection is already failing. When we go to the anchor section, we're going to see in a detailed way what the program is giving us. In this case, we see that we have two tables. The first of them is for the anchors that are working in tension. If you look, you'll see that all these forces are for tension. The table is exactly the same as the one that we saw, but with the particularity that the shear resistance, compared to the 50.2 that we had previously, has fallen significantly. We have values of 8.5 and so on. Evidently, this resistance will be different for each of the anchors, according to the tensile load that each one has. The greater the tension, the smaller the shear resistance of the anchor will be. Then, on the other hand, we have a specific check table for those anchors that are working in compression. What's the reason for this? Well, if I have anchors working in compression, in addition to the various checks that I can do, the compressive resistance of the anchor itself, and of the shear, I'll also have behavior that is unstable. Behavior that involves buckling in the anchor itself, and bending in the anchor. Therefore, the values that I'll have are the following. First, the compressive load of each of the anchors. See that they are negative values, values of compression. The shear corresponding to each of them. And the bending moment that corresponds directly to each of them, according to the shear value that it has. That is, for very small shear forces, shear of little significance, the bending will be of little significance, as we'd expect. On the other hand, I have values of resistance. I have compressive resistance, already reduced, taking into account this buckling of the fastener. Then I have the shear resistance, and then the bending resistance of the fastener. And here I have the various percentages. The percentage of utilization in compression, in shear, and in bending. Again, as always, with this drop-down option, I can see, for all these parameters, how they've been calculated. You see that here, for example, we have this section about the buckling of the anchor that the program is calculating to obtain this reduced percentage in compression. The final difference for us to consider is what happens when I introduce this separation with a mortar joint. Of course, the section for anchors in compression doesn't appear, given that the mortar itself already absorbs the compression. But we do reduce this shear resistance section here.
this value, taking into account the bending that the fasteners may have when the base plate is separated from the foundation block. Note too that, in this case, in the concrete block, straight away the stress is zero, because the base plate is separated from the concrete block, and so there's no pushing, there's no bearing. So, to conclude, my advice is that you always model the connection in the most realistic way possible, from the point of view of the dimensions of this concrete block. However, this separation, or this joint, only model it in those instances in which it's truly important. Of course, we've seen that a separation of the base plate from the concrete block is fairly important, and fairly harmful, that is to say, fairly unfavorable. And in the case of the mortar joint, it depends on the material that the mortar uses. If it is really a fairly resistant material, and we can assume that it will really restrict the bending of the fasteners, then it tends to be usual to not take it into account. It's better not to take it into account. In the event of using either a separation or a mortar joint, try to give it a value as similar as possible. Given that the more we separate the base plate from the concrete block, the more unfavorable this behavior will be. Finally, an additional comment about when we should use the option of shear transfer by friction and when we should use anchors. This tends to be resolved by looking at the results that we get in each case and comparing them. Of course, if the axial is of tension on the column, and even if we have a bending moment, as I've mentioned, the usual thing is that the transfer of shear force is by anchors. Given that, when the base plate is raised, it doesn't make much sense for the shear to be transferred by, by friction. However, when we have compressive axial force that provides us with a truly significant value of friction, then it is interesting, and we get the most realistic behavior considering the shear transfer by friction.